much. Hit it, boys. Back with another Tomato Fights, we got a special guest, Ken Jack, from Lights Camera Podcast, Barstool Sports, also a Twitter user and an Instagram user, all that shit. Ken Jack, come here, lover boy. <laughs> Very happy to join you guys. You know how much I love talking movies with you fellas. Awesome. Absolutely. This is the uh, this is the lowest ranking we have done on Tomato Fights. It is a matchup of 69s. Don't make a stupid joke there. It is 1987's Dirty Dancing versus 2005's Hitch. Honestly, had never seen either of these movies before. I definitely think that one is for sure better than the other. We'll get to that. Uh, Ken Jack, first question. What do you think of this concept for a podcast? I'm loving this because I think uh, we were talking about it a little before the show. We did something like relatively sort of similar uh on lcb where like we would have our third coast tro Bollins, like basically we would pitch him me and jeff would pitch him each a movie and he would pick which one is better and that was like our version of of, of uh the, the courtroom there and uh but here now it's like all three of us get to essentially definitively decide for anyone listening no one's allowed to have in any other extraneous opinions we tell you that which one is better correct? exactly correct yeah. yes we are the uh the the overwhelming authority on which movie is better here. Yeah, Pete has said a couple times, he's like, should we do something on like the Patreon or whatever where like after the listeners can vote on what they think is better and everything? And I'm like, no, uh, <laughs> not necessarily because I don't care what the listeners have to say. I definitely want them weighing in. But we're just smarter. I think like the concept, <laughs> I think the discussion about two movies is the better part of this than like actually saying, okay. We have they duked it out and we decided this movie's better than whichever. Like I don't want people to remember by the end of the podcast which was better. I just want them to get some like random ass conversation about two movies that shouldn't be associated with each other at and all. And now forever but are. Are because yes. of uh Rotten Tomatoes. Are you a tomatoes guy? Do you I mean you guys have moviewrankings.net, so mm -hmm. you uh you do your own thing, but how do you feel about the tomatoes experience? It's it's the only thing I dislike about it is that People don't understand it, which isn't necessarily Rotten Tomatoes' fault, mm -hmm. but the way it's presented to the public is just like, hey, yeah, it's 75%. That means every single person gave this a 75 out of 100. That's the average of what people thought, which is not the case. Right. It's just like if you have a 75%, 75% of critics gave it over a score of 75. Like, you know what I mean? It's very, it's very, when people read it at face value, they don't understand it. Sometimes I don't myself understand it. So that's the only thing I dislike totally about it and they get a bunch of shit wrong obviously just in my own personal opinion like one of the highest rated, rated movies they have is like barbershop the last cut it's like a 95 on rotten tomatoes not even fucking around at all like and then like gladiator is like a 60 like that shit drives me nuts but again that just it show goes to the show you the error or flaws in the system and i think that this podcast does a good job of exposing those flaws because we have already we've all this is our sixth one we've already had matchups that seemingly Quite, quite different in quality of uh, of movie. So um, I, I think that, you know, maybe maybe we're exposing uh, Rotten Tomatoes a little bit. I will say, did want to mention, MovieRankings.net has become an invaluable source of, mm. uh, or an invaluable tool for tomato fights because my favorite feature is that you can look up a movie and see where it is available for streaming. Mm -hmm. What to stream and where to stream it. That's our, our tagline. There you go. Century, which is, oh, it's a great one. Oh, now we have the holiday movie generator for the for those of you listening. Yeah, hopefully pre-holiday, so you can go and find a, a holiday movie you want to watch. If, but yeah, it's been getting a great response on it so far. I appreciate the feedback. If you want to get in on the uh, ripoff game or content stealing game, rankings wrestling would be a pretty strong podcast where you take two movies that you all have given the same ranking and decide. Which one is better? Or I could just take your guy's name because I'm just assuming you haven't copyrighted it yet. <laughs> That's true. And then sue you guys out of existence. Oh, that is absolutely something. That if you guys happen. can get yours on <laughs> Apple Music before us, that will absolutely cuck us because we <laughs> cannot get on Apple Apple Podcasts so far for some reason. I'm out on Apple Podcasts. <laughs> Apple Podcasts are over, man. I'm not even concerned with Apple Podcasts anymore. We're, we're vodcasting right now anyway, technically speaking. That's so. true. We're in, the, we're in the new age. Yeah. For... for 
for white mid twenties to early thirties guys. We're into the podcasting game. Uh, given that you're a white, I'll ask you uh, your experience with uh, these these movies. Uh, I don't need to say that given yeah, that you're like, a white, what? but uh, Dirty it's Dancing fair. is like some white, 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 oh, white yeah. shit. But before knowing that you'd have this conversation about these two movies, like how were these movies in your life? So Dirty Dancing is a movie my mom really, really likes. So that's one that like she had us watch at a relatively young age. Um, probably too young to be watching Dirty Dancing, to be honest. I mean, there's like an abortion in the 20th well, minute. Too, y- too young is Dirty Dancing's middle name. Yeah, they, that's true. They love the idea of too young. Despite everyone on there being too old. Like, yeah, Jennifer Grey's right. like 30 when the, she made this movie, which is correct. No, she's like 27, but still, I mean, it's insane. Um, I saw, I remember I read something once, like, I think Patrick Swayze was closer in age to the actress who plays Jennifer's mom mm. than he was to the age of his actual character in the in the movie. Yes. Which is insane. He played a 24-year-old, and let me tell you what Patrick Swayze was not. He was not 24 he, because he was 34 years old. He was a decade older than the character he played. But to his credit, uh, he didn't fool anybody. Nobody <laughs> yeah. thought that he was... Nobody thought, oh, well, he's 24-ish. No. Dude, that's some bullshit that like you, it's harder for movies and shows to get away with now. Like, th- I think the only time I even recently found one was um, there's a really, really good show on Netflix called uh, Never Have I Ever. Um, and like one of the main characters in that, he's supposed to be playing an eight, like I think a 17 year old is actually 31. And there's same with the show called Dairy Girls, also on Netflix, where one of the girls who's supposed to be like 15 is actually like 33, which is like just blows my shit up. Um, but yeah, sorry to answer your original question. Dirty Dancing was a movie I watched with my mom. Uh, Hitch was a movie I watched with my friends growing up. And we thought, like, this is the funniest shit we've ever seen because it's, <laughs> it's Kevin James dancing and people saying, hell no, you shouldn't be dancing because you're big and fat. And, like, me, I was thinking, like, dude, that's the pinnacle of comedy right there. And just, yeah. Tough on rewatch, but, yeah, that was that was the, the reference. On the uh, subject of actors playing way younger than they are, we bust out the occasional fun fact during the movie conversation did you know, and this was in the news recently, This, uh, did you know that Ben Platt is older than 16 years old? Yeah, no, but a lot of people, they were taken aback by that. They had no clue that this disgusting wet man on the, their movie screens that was digitally altered to look like a thin, creeping predator was actually not 16, and in fact, quite much, quite older than that. Well, it's, I Some mean, would say over 10 years. Yeah, it's confusing because you're like, oh, no, we didn't look like that when we were that young, and it's like, oh, yeah, we did. Oh, no. like, we, that's, I, that's truly what we all looked like when we were in high school. But ben... it's just like, we, we're, we're so removed from it that now when we look at current high schoolers like Ben Platt, we're like, man... We used to look like that. Ben Platt's stress veins are outrageous in that movie. So he, that man has some tough math homework. Mm-hmm. When he's in the orchard and like his yeah, neck. Yeah, is... yeah. It's outrageous. All right. Disgusting. Let's start with the 1987 film Dirty Dancing, a movie that neither Pete nor I had seen before. And we both realized that we didn't know what that movie was about. No idea. Uh, I honestly got it confused with Footloose, which I also hadn't seen, and I was waiting the whole time. I was like, at what point is it established that dancing isn't allowed? Yeah, I think they just like <laughs> don't like these people, but I think that they're like, yeah, for sure. Dan- like they're paying the people to dance. Uh, anyway, it is a movie about a 17 year old girl played by Jennifer Grey, whose name is Baby. She goes to a wasp family camp type si- hotel situation. With her family, her sister, who her two parents, and there is entertainment there, which is dancers who dance quite dirty, and they're not allowed to to mingle with the people. They're allowed to flirt with them, but they're not allowed to fuck. The boss <laughs> of the hotel always goes up to them. He says, whatever you do, you can't fuck. Don't fuck the customers. And they're like, fine, we won't fuck the customers. Uh, but they're doing like a secret moonshine operation where after hours they all get together and they dance real good they do the best dancing party you've ever seen and one of them gets pregnant penny gets pregnant impregnated by a guy named robbie who is a sociopathic college boy which those that's the other help around the the hotel camp is college boys with varying 
levels of socio yeah morality yeah. socio like there's a character named neil and he says uh i have to say i'm known as the catch of the county and he is the smallest douchebag of any of these college boys in this movie robbie who is a sociopath impregnates penny who is this very nice fine person who dances with johnny who is 34 year old patrick swayze playing a 24 year old she gets pregnant needs to get an abortion guess who's being no help that piece of shit robbie so uh baby hooks it up gets the money from her rich dad but oh no penny has a gig someone needs to dance in like two days so penny or a baby a child begins a sexual relationship with Johnny, who is a complete man and learns how to be a good dancer in two days. That is the mm-hmm. synopsis of the movie. If you haven't seen it. Few corrections. Uh-oh. Uh, the the man who runs the resort, yeah. who, by the way, his name is Max Kellerman. Yes. Which is probably the funniest part. What? Really? Yes. Yeah. yeah. As soon as you get to the resort, there's a big sign that says, Max Kellerman welcomes you. Yeah. Oh my God, I had no idea. That's the cra- he, he, he was the and in the credits. Really? Yeah, the, my first note was just Max Kellerman question mark. <laughs> it said and so and so as Max Kellerman. So Max Kellerman has some uh some hard and fast rules about not fucking uh, about the help not fucking, but hmm. should clarify, he doesn't want them to fuck the kids. He is very okay with the help fucking the horny old wives make the, yes. even if he doesn't even if you don't fuck them make them think they're gonna fuck yeah. because they are going to throw all sorts of money and be really really happy and really take care of this wasp family camp hotel that we've got running yeah the dynamic of the camp is wild because there's like arts and crafts for kids and then there's like light prostitution for the adults <laughs> Yeah, you're basically a gigolo. He was a big fan, Max Kellerman, apparently, of just like the blue ball uh, sort of notion. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. He's like, I want you to go so far as possible without fucking. Like, get as horned up as humanly possible. Get like get to, you know, third base and halfway to home and turn back. Like, he just did not want anyone to fuck, but he wanted to get as close as possible. Uh, The dance instructor in the beginning, there's a dance. I think that actually is Penny. Penny is showing everybody how to dance. They go to a dance class right off the bat. And by the way, Baby is just like your all-American normal kid studying. What do you like to do? I don't know, like read books, hang out with friends, that type who hasn't really done anything too crazy in her life. They go to a dance class and Penny, the instructor who, spoiler alert, is pregnant. Maybe she doesn't know yet. Uh calls breasts maracas and now mm-hmm. so do i i do that all the time yeah. too yeah i'd never <laughs> i'd never heard that before but she's really pushing the ladies to shake your maracas <laughs> outrageous it's kinda cool if boobs made like the maraca sound like if a girl just shake it is made like a well like... It, i mean they are like bags of sand so <laughs> yeah maybe, famously yeah d- depending on the uh the thickness of the grains perhaps <laughs> Uh, speaking of boobs, this was Wayne Knight's first major role. Yeah, mm. which is crazy because like he's playing like just Wayne Knight, like he's just playing the <laughs> Wayne Knighty role he plays in every movie and show ever. Which would like would never have made me thought, hey, this is w- Wayne Knight's breakthrough role because it's just the same role that he plays in everything. He's just Wayne Knight showing up and, and... rushing around, right? Yeah, mm. Wayne Knight should have played Smee. <laughs> wouldn't wouldn't uh, Wayne Knight have been a great Smee from? hook you know oh that little guy yeah i think he would have that would have been a natural fit he's like you know captain mean? hook's assistant yeah i think he could have been a good fit there he's i think he's good anywhere in a role where you need people to feel vaguely uncomfortable you know what i mean yeah like not like you don't want to feel like oh this guy's a real fucking creep you just want to me feel not at ease at all yeah um everybody in this movie ships Swayze and of Gray, or ships, mm-hmm. I should say, Johnny and Baby, except for one person. I'll say, despite the fact that 
they begin a sexual relationship and then have a big declaration of we have sex with each other party at the end of the movie in front of everybody, which I will point out a major, major flaw there. Uh, Swayze is never, or Johnny's never really into Baby. He's super mean to her and not in a, like, I'm flirting with you or I'm bullying you or negging you type of thing. He legitimately is like, Oh no! Well, this seems ridiculous. This this would seem inappropriate. I'm not interested in this person. Which I I, I initially would <clears throat> understand because Johnny is very I would say like low class or middle class. If he lived in the world of Aladdin, he'd be called a street, street rat. rat. Big yeah, um, oh yeah. And so you know maybe he's very judgmental towards the rich people, but he fucks old rich ladies. Yeah. Uh, I wonder is Johnny. A, I mean, obviously, that th- that relationship is what it is. But are we to view Johnny as like a bad guy, or is it like a hurt people, hurt people type situation with how mean he is to all the rich people? And also, this guy gets unfairly judged the whole movie. Like uh, Jerry uh, Jerry Orbach, the father. Uh, spends the whole movie thinking that this guy impregnated Penny and then just like, was like, eh, what? Well, <laughs> see ya. But he did nothing of the sort. He didn't impregnate Penny. He was too too busy <laughs> having sex with the... His daughter. The, 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 yeah, his, the, that guy's kid. But <laughs> that would be a funny scene. It's like, uh, I did not impregnate I that have. woman. I was having sex with your daughter. <laughs> right. I, I pull out of your daughter. Don't worry. Like, <laughs> he's a fucking sicko. If you really think about it, Johnny was almost like a proto-socialist in that he hated rich people, number one, and he earned free health care from, from baby, basically, yes. more or less. You know what I mean? Like, he's really, if you really think about it, that's where his real political ideals were at. Yeah. You know what's funny, though, is there are, like, some burns in this movie that don't make sense, and one of them is, so Penny needs this abortion. Robbie, piece of shit won't give her the time of day let alone the money of abortion and this is 1963 by the way this film takes place in 1963 so baby who is just really taken by this scene all these after hour dance parties and how dirty they dance she gets 250 dollars from her dad has to go to her dad and say hey can't tell you what it's for i need 250 dollars and he's like it's not illegal right and she's like, uh, no. He's like, word, let me break you off some. Gives her $250, yep. which in 1963, like if I, asked, a house. if I asked my dad in 2021 for $250, he'd be like, boy, what? Like there, there need to be a long conversation of like, what's going on here? She gets $250 out of her dad in 1963 in like a minute and a half. He's like, you get good grades. Here's $250. She goes and is like, hey. I have your abortion money, $250. Everyone's like, hooray, baby's the best. Oh, welcome to the gang. And Johnny says something to the effect of, oh, yeah, real brave getting the money from, or asking daddy for that. And I have no idea how everyone wasn't like, hey. yeah, for real, right? <laughs> yeah. It is, that is extremely tough to get $250 out of anybody in nineteen sixty, and then give it away, and then immediately yeah. give it away. Yeah, with jo- no questions asked. Johnny is uh, Johnny's quite rough and tumble, but although maybe that's... not a bad guy, just like a uh, very protective He's a rogue. Yeah, yeah. He's the every movie needed. I think after after Star Wars came out, every movie wanted the lovable rogue. Uh, you know what I mean? They want the Han Solo, and like you try to you you try to manufacture it in any way you can. I think Swayze has if you look at his whole film career he's always been that like he's effortlessly charismatic and Mm. sexy like when he's talking it when he's just teaching baby like dance moves and stuff you're like holy shit this guy's like oh yeah sexy like there's just something about him he's just got the it factor and like you see it again and stuff like you know point break whatever else like it doesn't matter like he always just has it and that's something that i think that they 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 did well in this movie like extremely well is like you're never rooting against johnny even when he's being a total prick to, like she just basically solved like uh, the arguably the biggest problem they could have in 1963 which is needing an abortion which like 
you could probably still be murdered for doing that, like if in 1963. And that was like a huge deal, and he was still an asshole to her about it. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite things about Johnny, or that's it's not a favorite thing because again, that's a dicey relationship. By the way, um, folks, see this movie now. If you haven't seen this movie yet, watch Dirty Dancing before Licorice Pizza comes out because that will soften the blow of any sort of uh, questions and or issues you might have. But I'll tell you, Ken Jack, you've seen um, you've seen Licorice Pizza, right? Still haven't seen it. I'm okay. still I'm still a little bit behind. I've only I've only seen the reviews, which are all all over the place to be honest it's excellent uh but there are think pieces coming i'll say this i meant to say this on our podcast this week pete licorice pizza and now patreon listeners you're getting a tease of what we'll talk about on the next episode licorice pizza no doubt is going to get la la landed where like people mm-hmm. love it at first and then people everybody, are going everybody to loves love it, it so much yeah. out of the gate and then hardos are going to be like Not that well good. then how can i be how can i be me about this and say, oh, guys, Paul Thomas Anderson isn't even that good. That's a thousand percent going to happen. And mm-hmm. I'm already ready to scream at people because you famously, Ken Jack, are a La La Land defender, which you should. Oh, be. yeah, I really La La Land like is La La Land. the best. Unbelievable movie. Great. Very, very good. Movie. Uh, but to get back to your original point of Licorice Pizza um, is has slightly loose morals with age yeah. and people falling in love and. That that is a theme of this movie as well. Yeah. So on on that on the age thing, how many times does Johnny say to Baby something to the effect of, "You just don't get it," or like, "You just don't understand." And I'm like, "All right, so you do, so you do understand that you are talking to a child." That, like, I think you that are he, an adult. Most of the times that he says that though it's are about, like, it, class. about class. Yeah. 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 But it's like you're rich, you wouldn't get it. It's like you're down in the rough and tumble streets of this upstate New York. Uh, luxury resort <laughs> that I dance at. Yeah, he does. Yeah, yeah. He's kind of he's confusing. I, I would love to have Johnny on the the podcast and just ask him like thirteen questions <laughs> because he says something like, "Only shot I ever had was dancing," or like, "You come from where I come from." Only w- he's a coal miner. Like, yeah, you're, dude, you're dancing. Like, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, worst jobs out there. And like, he he could easily just like be a stripper. Like he's basically stripping and like, or a, like pimping himself out to old ladies, dude, or an he athlete, says that line or like. During, so- he says it during the fucking when he's talking to um when he's talking to baby, right? He says something like, "Yeah, my my uncle got me a job in like a union of like uh, like electrical work or something." It's like, dude, that probably pays a shit ton <laughs> more than you get paid doing dancing. Are you kidding me? Union work? You're getting paid like 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 twenty dollars an hour in nineteen sixty three. Like yeah, you'd have been in great shape. He doesn't get to yell at children and then have sex yeah. with them. By yeah, being exactly. A union I guess worker. So. <laughs> um, this movie should have been called Jennifer's Body because mm. all it is is very close shots of Jennifer Gray's, you guessed it, body. And man, like th- they take this character, and again, like this all happens in the course of a week, right? A short stay yeah. at this hotel, and she. I mean, let me tell you, this kid finds herself. She goes from like. I'll just hang out, I'll read or whatever, to, like, I am a dance prodigy. Dance is my life, and dirty dancing is my life. Like, there's no, uh, all right, and a tapa, and a tapa, okay, now tap with me. Like, it just goes, like, right when he first dances with her, he's like, okay, you know, humping, right? All right, we'll start with that. Mm -hmm. And it is just, like, lots of close shots of... Gyration. Just gyration. Moving and shaking. And, I mean, obviously, Jennifer Grey, gorgeous. I feel bad. I don't want to spend too much time on this because this is something that she herself has acknowledged. So I don't want uh, to shed too much light on something that's a sensitive subject for somebody. Jennifer Grey famously uh, got plastic surgery and deeply regrets it because her signature look was her nose and as a person with a weird nose i feel for that like that she's obviously still very beautiful now but she's like damn i used to look like jennifer gray nobody else looked like jennifer gray so i'm not like judging nose jobs but that's a nose job that definitely shouldn't have happened Mm -hmm. i think uh there's a lot of weird 
production issues with this movie too, right? Like, uh, so there's there's a few things that I know happened is that they hated each other. Yep. Project Swayze and Jennifer. Whoa. I know that's one thing I only yeah. knew is that they really didn't like each other at all. He had to probably the age difference. <laughs> <laughs> it's a generational thing. He, he had to convince her to Dawn, do the right? movie. She want she didn't want to do the movie uh, because they did Red Dawn and she hated him and she didn't want to do Dirty Dancing and he was like, "You're gonna make a mistake." Oh, so this mm-hmm. is like this is Tommy Lee Jones and Jim Carrey type stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's one which is one of the funniest just off screen interactions I think I've ever heard of in my life. You, I'm sure <laughs> yes. you told your audience yes. about this before, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, and so the uh, fun fact, the story or the scene where he's like running his hand up her like arm and and like tickling her and oh, she's yeah. laughing giggling not scripted she was he was like legitimately getting annoyed that she kept laughing and they decided to keep it in the movie whoa those mm. were outtakes well well intakes yeah right i suppose <laughs> yeah Whoa. it's it's kind of weird too cuz like when you have a movie like this where it's all based on chemistry and like people believing that these two people are in love with each other and these people just fucking hate each other's guts like that's that's a tough kind of road to or, or bridge to cross right it's weird because that that worked extremely well with 50 shades of gray <laughs> yeah, they, i mean they yeah, had the, that's iconic on screen chemistry <laughs> and they actually didn't they weren't crazy about they, each other yeah and i don't mm. know how they how they made that work but i don't know it's kind of weird so well it's like Billy Joel like wrote some of the greatest love songs and he's been married and divorced a bunch of times. So I guess well, if you're truly great at the at the art, you can do you can do it artificially, but maybe not as as well in real life. So I'm, I, I'm still uh, rooting for of... those two with the Fifty Shades of Grey, by the way. They're getting together at some point in no, real life. Not. Absolutely. They not. so those two, it's so funny. And I was gonna say, like the the it's the two of the worst on screen chemistries I can think of are Jamie Dornan and um oh my god, Kristen uh no Dakota, Dakota Johnson yeah. and uh also um Robert Pattinson and I was that's what I was looking ah. for there. Uh what's her name? Kristen oh my Stewart. gosh. I'm remembering all the guys' names because I'm very deeply sexist on the inside. Um, but both, all four of those people, when they got rid, just got loose from those shitty franchises, have done incredible things. Like yes. if you guys had seen Belfast yet, oh my God, Jamie Dornan cuts a rug in that. He's incredible. He, he's probably gonna be Oscar nominated. Um, like it, the fucking Dakota Johnson has been amazing. Basically everything I've seen her since in since this movie. Uh, Kristen Stewart just gonna get a nomination for playing Lady Die. Yeah. Robert Pattinson is killing it. Mm-hmm. That's why Batman. Like it's so weird how like a bad chemistry can just absolutely tank the public perception of an actor when that is what the movie is like reliant on. And when you look at these two these two actors, I think that they not only were they able to like, kind of power through it for the sake of this movie, but like they both obviously went on to have pretty solid careers, I'd say. Although I would say that this is this is the second best movie I remember Patrick Swayze from because I love Red Dawn despite it being tremendously huge american propaganda it was just a propaganda movie but who cares but that and i think for jennifer Grey, it's definitely dirty dancing like that's the movie i know her from i know her from uh ferris bueller's right, day off right uh that's Which definitely fair. One. That's but totally that fair. that's because i that's probably because i hadn't seen dirty dancing until this point <laughs> um do you and that's by the way that's uh some real like pesci shit right there where their biggest and best things you're like man i bet that like this was done at various points over a decade and it's like no all done within one year or like two years mm-hmm. because Ferris Bueller was 1986. And oh, wow. one year later, the angry sister is now the hot dancer. Uh, I don't know if you know this, Ken Jack. I don't know if you know this. Uh, Patrick Swayze was at least the third choice to play I Johnny. I love things like this. At least the wow. third choice to play Johnny. The role was written for somebody in mind. Tommy Lee Jones. Yes, exactly. <laughs> They just they had to they had to go younger for for Johnny. Unfortunately, yeah. they wanted him to be forty. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> Harrison Ford. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> no, they they wrote the role for somebody with somebody specifically in mind, and he was so bad at dancing that they had to completely change the character, including the ethnicity. Kevin James. Yes. So bad at dancing. <laughs> Casting director Will Smith was like, don't ever do that again. Uh, yeah. It was written, it was initially written for Billy Zane. Whoa. Wow. It was initially written for Billy Zane, and Billy Zane was so bad at dancing, the character was supposed to be Italian, 
so bad at dancing that they had to like fire him or not not cast him. Rewrote the role, offered it to Val Kilmer. Whoa, who turned it down? Them. And then Patrick Swayze. So you're it. telling me a movie studio said, "Fine, twist my arm. We'll make the character a white guy." <laughs> <You're right. laughs> we uh, it's funny you mentioned Billy Zane. We had gotten offered him a couple of days ago to do an interview with, and I was like, I don't know what the fuck I would talk to Billy Zane about. But if I knew this, I might have Dirty said yes. Like, I have no idea. Damn. I was like, I don't want to talk to him about Titanic or whatever else. Yeah, that that I feel bad for. Like you, you need to find something if you have a Billy Zane because you don't want to be like Titanic. Uh, so, what's yeah, a right. Zoolander? That was like, but that even that was like, hey, it's the guy from Titanic. So what was it like yeah. being in Zoolander as the guy from Titanic? Similar to um, like James Vanderbeek, clearly has mm. a good sense of humor about James Vanderbeek, given that he plays himself in Don't Trust the Bee. But even that, I'd feel bad because like everything just goes back to, hey, because you're Dawson, right? You know, mm-hmm. so. Although I do love, uh, was it Varsity Blues? Yeah. Yes. Oof. That's a real good one. Yeah. Absolutely. That's one that I've never seen. I, I have. Oh, you, got, you guys would like, that's a good movie. I've seen that's Varsity up there Blues. for me with like, uh, uh, not like, it's not like Remember the Titans dramatic or anything like that, but it's a very cornball hmm. sports movie that I appreciate. Uh, on the subject of these movies that we're doing and movies like that and Remember the Titans. I had to rewatch A Place Beyond the Pines after doing prep oh, for this yeah. podcast because of Ava Mendez. And I was like, did they meet on Place Beyond the Pines? When did Ryan go? Like, Google and like, then I was like, yeah. oh, fuck it. I'm watching Place Beyond the Pines. That has got to be one of the worst movies that I've watched a lot of times. That like, How many times have you seen it? I really just watched the first half because who cares about the second half with the kids? But yeah. I watched the first like. Well, it, the the fun part about that movie is that it's like three movies in one. It's insane, yeah. and none of them mm-hmm. are good. But like the first one is a bad movie that I don't mind watching. Gosling when he goes into the I mean, Place Beyond the Pines would be great for tomato fights. Uh, but Gosling when he goes into the bank and is screaming to like everybody put the money in the fucking bank. Like it is the most Tom Brady shrill, painful shit in the world, but I can't stop watching it. <laughs> anyway, uh, they use fingerprints to catch the Schumachers. Insane. I was shocked by that in 1963. Yeah. They think that Johnny is going around stealing people's wallets, and Baby knows that he's not doing it because he's got an alibi, and the alibi is all the fucking that he's Penis, been doing yeah. with her, and she has to say. It's not Johnny. Don't fire Johnny. How do you know, baby? Because we're fucking. And they're like, shit. Well, Johnny's for sure fired. We told him absolutely no fucking. (laughs) What does he do? He goes and fucks this kid. So, well, I guess now we're going to try to figure out who did it. And baby thinks that it's the Schumachers. They end up at the end being like, hey, by the way, we looked into it. Did some finger. They, They used fingerprinting to find that the Schumachers are going around to rich wasp hotel camps and cleaning them out they said that they'd hit like yeah like a six bunch places of yeah uh hilarious um when was this again 1963 93 yeah i'm pretty sure you could just murder people then oh yeah and, and get away with it like 90 percent of the time they it's so funny you just move like 10 miles away and just change your name and everyone's like oh fucking i don't give up and oh, yeah, those are the them. shoe makers couldn't be their name's too different yeah. <laughs> and these people get caught robbing wallets yeah, when you've got street rats that you can easily frame. Right. Like, you, they could have done such a better job framing anybody else. Uh, Swayze hits two things, notably in this movie. He hits that, uh, but in addition to hitting that, he hits Robbie, and that is the most satisfying ass-kicking you will see in a movie. It's because such a bad fight scene. Though. Robbie, what fight scene? <laughs> Rob, I guess Robbie at some point does get up and does, like, the... <sighs> and like the bear hug type of thing but they do this move no. which is a staple of 80s they do the 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 two hand like diamond drop yeah which every 80s fight scene needed for some reason that's that's not correct though because uh robbie does get a good shot in because patrick swayze's character says hit me you have not yet that's hit me right. in this fight this is just one way assault Gives him... please hit me back yeah <laughs> that's right even though i mean we've seen how these characters get treated i don't think there's going to be any question of, hey, this wasn't one-way assault, right? They'll say, med school boy got beat yeah. up by this guy. Okay, you're going away for a long time. 
Your dancing days are over. Hey, you're going to be dancing, doing the jailhouse rock. <laughs> Get out of here, Swayze. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. We're tossing you in jail. Uh, can I talk about my biggest issue with this movie? Not yet. Shoot. Not yet. Not yet. Fuck oh, off. Why can't I talk about my biggest issue? Because you're going to the movie? end. I know you're going to the end, right? No, it's right okay. in the beginning. All right. All right, go ahead. No, I just want to win that fight. All right, okay. No, go ahead. Uh, I, <laughs> My biggest complaint is that this entire movie is quite sexy. It's called Dirty Dancing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The least sexiest part of this movie are the sex scenes. Every second of this movie is sexier than the sex scenes. I would posit somebody dying after an abortion gone wrong is less sexy than she doesn't some die of the but that they're like worried she's about dying her. yes right yeah, she's right dying. okay fair enough that is that is probably there less are lots sexy. uh there, there's a lot of uh jerry orbach scenes yeah. jerry orbach looks pretty good in this movie yeah and you know there's something um, sexy about a, a, a dad <laughs> who just like cares for his family the way that he does that's right I'll say a good guy he he right. incorrectly he has the wrong idea of johnny but that's a good guy, by and large. He learns his lesson. Yeah. So. Protecting his daughter. Yeah. Protecting his daughter by giving her grants of, like, $250, which you could, like, buy, like, a Cadillac with. The best way the that time. he learns his lesson, by the way, is by going up to Robbie, being like, hey. Uh, Here's money. Th we live in a time where I'm just supposed to blindly assume that a young white man is uh, really an upstanding citizen. So here's money. And Robbie says, oh, man. You know that I am the one that impregnated Penny, right? It's super cool that you're willing to overlook that. <laughs> so then the guy's like, you know what? Give me half of that money back. <laughs> now he takes all the money back. That's how he it, learns. I do like the line he says when, or when um, Orbach, that is, when he gives uh, Baby the money. He says, like, I have a D by the end of the night. Like, he had to go out and make collections or something <laughs> right. like that. Like, he's just going to the bank. But, like, the way he phrased it, I was like, he's going to beat the shit out of somebody, like some storefront owner for protection money to get it to her. He's yeah. got to steal some wallets. <laughs> Yeah, true. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be a plot twist if it, was, if it was the doctor dad who was stealing the wallets He's to pay for abortions. Shoemakers. He framed the Schumachers, and the way to frame the Schumachers is to lazily frame uh, yeah. the, the, the street rat. He's not above that. He's just accusing that guy of everything anyway. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So when somebody – so people will immediately see – Oh well, this is a shoddy framing job, and then you go to the next layer of the frame, which is the Schumachers. Blame them, you're home free. All right, Who what's your bucks? what's your biggest uh, your biggest complaint? At the and we're gonna get into some uh, on with the Braveheart conversation. Rachel Bonetta made the best point that has been made in this entire podcast's run, which is she asked the question of, "Wait, did they even say fuck back then?" And we looked it up, and in the Braveheart era. People did not say fuck. So that was a major inaccuracy because they were just swearing up there a storm. There was a trillion inaccuracies in Braveheart. Yeah. And I, that was like the that's bottom tier of the list. So there there's so people bitched so much after that. I remember I was like reading articles um, for that were published in the 90s or whatever from like Scotland, wherever else. People got so mad at the inaccuracies in that. And the same with Gladiator. Like people really dug into it. I thought Whoa. it was funny though about Braveheart because like the guy who wrote Braveheart was like inspired by seeing the statue in Scotland or wherever it was and like hearing the story and he was like, oh man, this is such a good story. I'm going to make a movie about this. And then he just like changed everything. <laughs> he was just mm -hmm. like, oh, what a great story. It's mine now and I'm taking liberties. <laughs> okay. Yep. Okay. So the big issue with this and I tried to Google think pieces about it and shame on think piece places for nobody ever pointing this out at the end of the movie he goes up he says nobody puts baby in a corner by the way i can't believe we haven't hit on that that line uh it was very disappointing for me i was really thought thinking it was going to be like some like big build up but it was just kind of like a throwaway a basically random, like in the, mm. the the in the midst of a conversation he was like hey baby's sitting in that corner can we, can we uh, rearrange the chairs uh you let's know, get baby out here you know who uh also was disappointed about that line who Patrick Swayze didn't want to say it. Really? Yeah, he like put up a fight. Was like, I this is stupid. I'm not saying this. I mean, it it, it is a stupid line. It is very stupid. It's very forced, very inorganic. In yes, exactly. It's very inorganic in hindsight. But he gets up on stage and he says, "Hey, everybody, I'm fucking this little thing over <laughs> here, and I get to do the big dance at the end. I get to. This is the big party at the end, and I get to do the dance. You got these fucking nerds up here singing this." trash song Absolutely baby trash. your sister sucks at singing 
All of you, mm -hmm. stop singing. You're fucking singing in unison like a bunch of white people. This is horrible. So I brought my song I'm going to put on, and me and my little fuck partner are going to dance for you all. He then puts on The Time of My Life, which that song shimmers like no song in the world. When it comes on, the now on, dun, 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 all the synths and everything, the drums come in. Dun, 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 it's 1963. Yep. Love Me Do and I Saw Her Standing There is what the music was. You know when they're dancing in the, that scene and she's doing the, come here, lava boy, that thing? That was a modern song. That song was from 1957. This song, The Time of My Life, is the most 1987 song in the world. The idea that that type of music could be made in 1963 is the most insane thing in the world. And it's not like... Oh, you know what? This sounds a little more like late 60s, because even by, like, by the end of the 60s, music sounded vastly different than it sounded in the early 60s, which is why the Beatles are so fascinating. But it wasn't even like that. Like, yeah, this sounds late 60s, or even this sounds 70s. This is like Kokomo era <laughs> 1987 shit, and they just play it. Oh, he walks up with the 45. I walked in uh, to record with Pete, and I was like, hey, Pete. I need to see the end again because I needed to see what he was holding in his hand when he put that on because I wouldn't have been fucking surprised if it was a CD. It is indeed a mm -hmm. 45, but no fucking way. People would have in real time, in, in like reality, they would have reacted to the song more than they would have reacted to, wait, they're fucking, he's so much older. Like all, <laughs> all these different things. It would be like, like imagine if they made a new version, a new Dirty Dancing, which I believe they did too. They made a remake of yeah. it, I think. Uh, and then also the Footloose one. Um, but imagine if they made one today set in the 80s and then the, the key marquee song was sung by like Bruno Mars. It was like, leave the door open <laughs> yeah. or something like that. Like it would be like, well, what the fuck? Like that's just like, not appropriate for the, the time or era you're set in. Especially when the movie, like if you're playing that sort of music throughout the whole movie, fine. But they play era appropriate music throughout the entire movie up until that point. And it's a lot of it. It's like 15 songs, all era appropriate. And then all of a sudden just, the exclamation point just is like in red ink, you know? And yeah. It just doesn't and stand, stand out. The first, um, the first Moog synthesizers weren't even in studios until 1964. And that's like, you are not making the time of my life with like the first primitive synthesizers. That like, they mm -hmm. were using some like digital synth from like some Yamaha really cool state of the art shit when they made that song, the time of my life. So that I cannot believe no one's like, what? How the fuck did like now there's like some Back to the Future shit going on? I do know that they uh they came up with the name of the movie before they came up with the plot of the movie. Love so it. So I feel like they came up with the name of the movie and they were like the final scene is going to be dancing to the time of my life and everything else doesn't matter. We'll fill it in. Uh mm -hmm. another thing is this... I think of Sandals Resorts, by the way, when I hear that song. Yeah. yeah, I don't think of this movie at all. I always think of Sandals Resorts commercials. <laughs> yeah, hijacked for sure. Uh, and I'm like, shit, I want to go to Sandals. And then I forget about it two seconds later. Did you know, by the way, I didn't know who, I never knew who sang that song. Uh, that you, That's one of the Righteous Brothers. Doesn't mean really? anything to me. Yeah. That's fucking great. So, See, I have no clue who sang it at all. Me neither. It's, you just said it's Bill Medley and Jennifer Warnes, but Bill Medley is one of the fucking Righteous Brothers. So, like, Bill Medley's got to be dead or something or close to it, but this guy that was making songs that they would have been listening to in Dirty Dancing just, like, 30 years later just banged out a huge, huge, huge hit. I wonder if that song's made him more money than anything else. And then uh, Green Day was watching this and like, what if I, instead of time of my life, <laughs> time of your life, Ooh, moneymaker right there. This seems like a good riddance idea People uh, love this stuff this is a case <laughs> this movie has a, a great example where the cover is better than the original in that the when they do the lift it's better in crazy stupid love and it hits way better in crazy stupid love than when they do it in this movie the two things that i knew i was getting from this movie were or actually three one was that it's a town where you're not allowed to dance i did not get that mm -hmm. and i was quite confused one was that uh they do the lift thing, and one was that nobody puts baby in a corner. Lift, disappointing. Nobody puts baby in a corner. Big trash. Hated that. Uh, fun yeah. fact about the lift, that was the first and only time that they did it. 
They well, didn't. Wow, like one it. take. It Did, like it. Didn't, practice. It uh, like they didn't practice. Jennifer Grey was too scared to practice it. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, they got it in one take. That's crazy. Defined and that's, and that is, I agree with you guys on both points in that. I do think the no one puts baby in the corner. Like that's a line that they say in like pop culture and stuff like that. Like people reference it all the time. It's definitely not as impactful in the movie because it does feel so out of, or just doesn't sound like something he'd say. Yeah. yeah. It just doesn't sound like it's not something a human would say to another human. Um, and then the lift, I don't know if it just wasn't shot particularly well, but like, because like it was cool, you'd see her like smiling up there, like yeah, we did it, blah 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 blah. But like, they, there could have been a more like grandiose mm-hmm. feel to that big moment, and it just it didn't. That kind of fell a little flat. I mean, it would have, I'm almost surprised they didn't just end the movie on that note, like just up in the air, freeze frame, done. You know what I mean? Because that seemed like that's what they were going towards. No, then they then rolled the credits, and it was like a Justin Bieber song, and you're like, yeah, hey, Justin, and, this and they were like, not even alive yet. And they were like, Johnny died two years later from natural causes. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. He died falling off a roof at the electric electricianer's <laughs> union or whatever. Electricianer. That sounds like I'm confusing magicianer or something like that with an electrician. Oh, yeah. Also not a word. Yeah. Magician. Neither are things. <laughs> Practitioner of magicians. Yes. There you go. That would be great if they did like uh, what happened to everybody at the end. They're like, mm-hmm. this happened. This happened, like, uh. Robbie Jennifer Grey was in a car with Matthew Broderick that hit two young people that died in Ireland, oh. which is a fact. Oh, I didn't that. know that he was with oh, her in that no. that accident. Dude, I, I think I'm almost paused. I'm pretty sure that she like it happened right after when the movie was coming out or something like that. Like what? I know she didn't do press for the movie, any of that shit. Like she was in the car with yep, Broderick she was. when that car hit. Yikes. Yeah, and killed to killed a mother and daughter in Ireland. Oof. And Matthew Broderick went on to do other movies, which is cool. Uh so this is pardon my ignorance. Did, yeah, I didn't know this. They dated, and that is some real like, uh, some like sibling uh, incest porn type thing of like yeah. Ferris Bueller and sister. <laughs> like, mm. I know that they don't, that they're not actually related, but that should that that seems kind of taboo to date yeah. your work. Sister? Also weird connection that Sarah Jessica Parker auditioned for the role of baby. Oh, huh. really? Yeah. So like there's well, a sir, weird triangle a going on here. They definitely had a type for, for sure. For baby. See, I'm, I'm looking to try and find other on screen siblings that have dated before because I feel like that's definitely like a more common thing than maybe you realize. That would be uh, a good di- post. Selena Gomez and her brother the guy who played her brother from Waverly Place. Mm-hmm. Uh Jennifer Carpenter, Michael C. Hall from Dexter. Yeah, I remember that. I remember that emphasis. Carrie Fisher and Mark Hamill. That I didn't know, which is kind of crazy. That seems like something I would know. Yeah, that was mothers. That's cool. Interesting. Well, I mean, famously in Star Wars, they kind of date too. (laughs) Yeah, that's a bit of a fuck up. I guess life imitates art. (laughs) Yeah, right. All right. So, unless we have any more thoughts on the very fascinating Dirty Dancing film, quite fascinating for sure. I'm excited mm-hmm. to say which of these movies I think is better. Same. But we're going to get to that. Uh, first, we'll do Hitch. This is a movie I also had never seen before and was a little, also a little surprised by what it ended up being. I thought that this was a full-on Will Smith, Kevin James movie. It really isn't. Uh, Hitch is, I believe, Alex Hitchens, mm-hmm. a man who is a quote-unquote date doctor. He helps fellas end up dating and marrying, in many cases, women that they deem to be out of their league. And he is working with a man named Albert, who really fancies this rich, noteworthy heir to a bunch of money. Kind of, is it like a Paris Hilton type thing? Sort of, yeah. And he then also meets this gossip columnist, who is played by Eva Mendez. They strike up a relationship Eva Mendez has a friend who ends up sleeping with some jerk that Hitch won't work with. And it ends up being a thing where everyone's trying to figure out who everybody is. And at the end, Will uh, Will Smith gives this big speech about like, hey, you know what we're doing here really isn't wrong. It's society. And there's this whole thing. And all I was thinking this entire movie was, oh my God, it is a good thing. This movie came out before the term incel was part of the <laughs> daily conversation because this movie is incel as AF. It is so 
Well, you know, if you would just let, if you would just let the guy be with who he wanted to be with, he'd be a really good guy. This is on you, ladies. Ugh. Yeah, that one is, uh, if they try to remake Hitchhiker, there's a lot of movies from, I think, 2000 to 2005, like Shao Hao, great example, oh, where yeah. they think the lesson is very positive, and it's really kind of not. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. He's, yeah. Just tough, uh, He's just not that yeah, into you. He's just not that into you. The By the way, Ava Mendez's friend is essentially every Jennifer Goodwin character, <laughs> which is like, oh, I mean, I don't get, like, I, 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 don't I, get I, I just can't find a guy. What's wrong with me? And it's like, it is literally that you keep saying, you keep yelling, I can't find a guy. Like, you've got your shit together, and you seem really cool, and you're pretty. Like, just stop yelling, what's wrong with me? Because people are going to hear that and say, it sounds like something's wrong with her. <laughs> Not wrong. Uh, and that was a pretty... Uh, Attitude is everything. <laughs> and that was a well-tied-together synopsis. It, this movie is a bit all over the place. Oh, I, I'm just going to, like shoot my wad a little here i thought this movie sucked i think this movie sucks and i think the dirty dancing is so much better than it but we'll officially say that in a little bit the first note that i have about this movie and its ridiculousness is who the fuck <laughs> decided to cast michael fucking rapaport uh, as like the mm -hmm. big family man who like is trying to the get alex hitchens buddy. to settle down yeah he plays yeah. uh he plays John Favreau in the breakup. Yes. Of yeah. Like, that like, hey, look, man, I'm going to be your shoulder to cry on, but I got a lot of guidance to give here, yeah. and I got to give it to you, buddy. And it's Michael it's, Rapport. If you had any movie set in New York during any point in the, from like 1997 to 2010, like Michael Rapport just had like a contract that he had to be in a, in a bit <laughs> role at some point. Like he just had to appear. And just, I don't know why it is. Because he's just like, especially in this role, <laughs> Like, he just does not fit the bill no. at all. If anything, the roles would be kind of reversed. He'd be the sleazeball creeping on girls yes. at the bar, and Will Smith would be the guy clearly already happily married with family, although that hasn't really worked out for him in real life, apparently. So, <laughs> uh, And there's just no chance that Alex Hitchens would be friends with Michael Rappaport's character in that movie. Ever. Not a chance. It, it, it's funny that you guys, I think, or we, we ended, you guys ended up picking these two movies to compare, because I do think that they are... They're comparable on the level, especially in the main lead, because I think that Will Smith and Patrick Swayze are very comparable humans, especially the way that the, the roles that they usually do. Like, he's super charismatic, super smooth. It's very much in the same vein as Swayze in that sense. So that's why I think this is a great... I think that would be a great place, point to focus on. But um, they, I think an issue with this movie is that it's different when you're comparing... When you're going back and looking at old movies, when you're looking at comedy versus drama. Like, drama can be more timeless, even if they have songs that are out of place. Uh, <laughs> comedy is definitely very relative to the time it's released. Um, like, there's lines in this where, like... What's his name? Um, uh, Kevin James is like, Yeah, you see the plans for the Jet Stadium on the west side? Like, stuff like that. Like, that's... It's all, like, Stefan Marbury at when they're yeah. the next game. So much stuff like that where it's just entrenched into that time period. They have, like, Sony Ericsson's, all that shit. And it's not a period piece. It's a movie that's just released at that time. So, like, that stuff is harder in, in retrospect, even if you look at the societal view, like we were saying before, like, this movie doesn't play over well now in 2021. If I think if you look at it on the, the more, like, relative scale for where it came out, it's better than you think, but still not that great. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely not that great at all. I'm fascinated by the Will Smith, Patrick Swayze thing that you just brought up, because I never would have thought of that before, but they were... Like, I don't know that it's like a Billy Joel, Elton John thing where it's just like such an obvious thing. Like, oh, you both do the exact same thing. But like, they definitely scratch similar itches with their with their characters. But I, I wouldn't I never thought, I guess. Yeah. And like, there's kind of uh, I, I guess timeline wise, they kind of overlap. But Swayze was a bit before Will Smith. But and like both characters are. uh are like they have their shit together but they're very defensive and like guarded oh yeah and that they feel like they've been wronged so that they kind of keep their defenses up yeah for sure they, they they'll have like a kind of a an almost childlike honorable like psyche behind it you know what i mean mm -hmm. like they they always want to think they're doing the right thing but it's put walls up and it's, it's it prevented them from getting too close to anybody like that's their thing and that's something and that i think they both of them, in a sense, got a little typecast as because Swayze, for sure. Like you look at him in 
Point Break, look at him in uh, any, Red Dawn, anything like that. He's always the honorable guy doing the right thing, regardless of what others are doing. And same thing with Will Smith. Like, he's always the charming, charismatic guy. And whenever they try and get him out of that, it's usually been a, not a success with the exception of King Richard, which he was fantastic in. Very, so, very good at. So one of my many issues with this movie, uh, other than that it doesn't have an interesting storyline at all, is that uh, it's kind of like low-hanging fruit slash... Um, preview fair kind of where or like like trailer fair and it definitely is dated to the time in which it was made because when i think to like generic early 2000s comedies you do have the like big guy dancing cut to smooth cool guy going and i know that he oh, doesn't say this it. but like saying like you did not just do that or like uh check please and like yep. that's all this movie is where he's like kevin james like yeah let me just reach for that and will smith's like oh great now i got a button my face which is part of why i didn't really love the most recent curb your enthusiasm because one of the storylines was there's a fat Josh roofer. Gad's yeah. fucking underwear <laughs> yeah right and like guy bending over and like oh god now his butt's in my face and not to say that like but in face humor it can't be funny but if that's if if that's what your big laughs are and i can guarantee you because i i knew the dancing thing and never do that again was in the trailer because i that was the only thing i knew about this movie going yeah. in yeah and they really shoehorned that in like that Albert Brenneman's character never gave off like any sort of vibe that that man would feel confident in dancing and oh yeah he's like he's afraid of his own shadow yeah exactly and yep I mean, it just comes out of nowhere. It's so stupid, and it's, you know, everything is sort of like you've seen it before. Yeah, and I mean, I, I just don't, I, I don't understand the, or I guess I do understand because, like, a lot of people are shallow. I don't think, like, the people in the relationships are shallow, but I think that, like, a lot of, like, viewers are shallow and that they say this a person that looks like this doesn't end up with a person that looks like this. Um but I, I just don't think that that's actually how it works. Like, clearly, that's not how it works. Because you see people well, all the time like, oh, like this person's tall or this person's like all, all these different things. So the idea that there were so many movies made around the premise of like, how does this guy get with this girl? Like what? Ha and even I remember uh, New Girl did it. They did like a reverse of it where Schmidt is with somebody who like historically would not look like somebody that gets with that character. And I'm like. Have these people been to Earth before? That shit happens all the time, dog. <laughs> the, uh, the funny thing is, too, I think for a lot of viewers that are watching this, they must have almost been used to it because Kevin James, that's his thing. Yeah, He right. plays just consistently in everything he's ever done. He's, you know, the, the, he's the, the John Everyman, heavier, out of shape dude that is with, like, the smoking hot woman, and that's just his thing. And so, like, that's where I think that air of believability, I guess, is just kind of lost a little bit he's literally the ceo of having hot significant others like that's if you want to use like an outdated tiktok term that's his job and um it, it almost reminds me of and i like how you mentioned you kind of alluded to this it almost reminds me of a you ever watched the movie dinner for schmucks yeah it's almost like that where like they think they're being like uh, enlightened by showing off the the miscreants but and really like they're making fun of them you know what i mean yeah it's it's a very it's a false perception of themselves and like what they're doing in this movie. Um, I, I do think that there's a lot to like in it. Um, some of the lines are funny. I think it's also like weirdly a who's who of like you're watching it. And you're like, oh, that guy. Like, like and you know what I mean? Like you'll be watching it and um, like the first three people that um, Hitch was, was showing to him. Like, oh, I know that guy. I can't put my finger on blah, blah, blah. Like, um, uh, what's his name? from in one of my favorite movies role models the guy uh joel Trulio. dub dub joel Trulio, yeah, joel yes. Trulio, and if for two seconds and i'm just like holy shit there's joel Trulio. like there's so many characters like that that show up in this movie which is crazy that part of it was fun the best um, one i love jeffrey donovan too by the way i'm a big yeah. burn notice guy so I love seeing him oh hell yeah and uh the best one though is uh stellan skarsgård who's not actually in the movie Alex. what stellan's the old one stellan's the old guy oh okay alex, alex, yeah, alex skarsgård sorry well, big Mama Mia guy over here. Um, <clears throat> Love it. Alex Skarsgård uh, is in the movie but doesn't have any scenes. He is the picture of Allegra Cole's ex-boyfriend, Sebi. Oh, I love that. Yeah, it's yep. hilarious. I'll tell you what. I'm shipping Alex, uh, Allegra and Sebi. <laughs> yeah, that's right. 
I love that he was couple. A, if you had a New York City movie, I guess you just needed also Alex Scarzer because if you remember Zoolander, he was one mm. of the gas station guys. That's right. Oh man, outrageous to care, uh, cast that guy as like an any man, like a bit that, role, that, like, like extremely handsome guy. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, he was. Uh, he was there. I also like something that threw me off about this movie, and maybe I'm maybe you guys will just agree, but like. Allegra Cole has, like, no redeeming qualities. So that's, uh, I noticed, like, what's so, and again, like, different strokes, different folks, and it's all, at the end of the day, folks, it's all about compatibility. So Mm -hmm. if this Albert, is it Albert Brenneman? Yeah. If Albert and Allegra are compatible, then hell yeah. Sure. That's it. But I did, I did find it interesting that, like, she was this like impossible. How could I ever get right. this person? Person, and we never actually get anything from her other than like, wow, isn't it so nice of her to right, like yeah. talk to this guy? Mm-hmm. There's nothing that she like really brings to the table other than being like a like a semi hot heiress. Yeah, but and... they also don't. In fa- fairness to her, they don't spend much actual time no. on her or him. So like. There's very confusing character development with uh, him, Pete, as you mentioned. He's like this very confident dancer who yeah, who is hiring somebody because he's unable to speak to a woman. Like, I don't... Mm-hmm. Those, those qualities don't seem to go hand in hand. And once basically he sets them up, once Hitch sets them up, they go on like a date and a half. And there's a scene where he throws his inhaler and kisses her. And then other than that, it's just like a lot of Will Smith and Eva Mendez. And I, I was wondering, like, two-thirds of the way into the movie, I'm like, is Kevin James in this movie anymore? Like, how many? He has, like, four <laughs> scenes. Also, the balance like, is definitely off, because, right, they're, they're, it's the two couples. You're telling the two stories there, right? It's probably, like, 75% Will, Will Smith and Eva yeah. Mendez. Yeah, versus, and I didn't even know um, Mendez was in this movie before I saw it. And uh, I don't know how much money Kevin James pays for uh, – Hitch's services. I assume it's a lot because Hitch has quite a bit of money. Yeah. Is oh, yeah. seemingly doing very well in New York City and he's quite exclusive. Um I, whatever he paid, he did not get his money's worth because he Hitch does nothing. Does absolutely nothing. So that I think though is the lesson because right. at least in Albert's case, the decision to go for Allegra was th- that that is his payment. Like him does him deciding I'm going to hire this person to pay to uh, hook me up with Allegra. Really, he'd accomplished the what he needed more than anything, which was obviously confidence Push, and yeah. belief in himself. So once he said, OK, I'm doing this, it's like signing up for the gym and then actually going to the gym. You know, like mm-hmm. it's not necessarily that he signed up for the gym. It's that he made a decision to better himself and do this. So at well, the end. Allegra's like, wait, so what did you even end up doing for him? And Hitch is like, eh, not Nothing. much. Yeah. Like, yeah, damn right, didn't do yeah. much. Like he, more like he hired like a personal trainer and then just started going to the gym instead. You know what yeah. I mean? Like he yeah. just, just stopped going top, stop getting lessons after like a week. You know what I mean? And I, I think that there is a sort of a, a charm in the dynamic between Will Smith and uh, Kevin James. But I think there's there's two issues in that. I, I like you were saying, Allegra Cole is just not particularly. Like she's not unapproachable at all. She's like very much. She's like, I can't fucking talk to this woman. It's like the only reason you wouldn't be able to talk to her is because she's just more attractive than you. Like she's the by by far the most easygoing and nice person in this entire movie. Yeah. And I think they should have had for someone at this level of celebrity that's that rich. She should have had more of a barrier up. There should have been a, a hurdle, a legitimate hurdle for Kevin James to get over. In order to impress her, and yeah, like was like she per, like pursued him more than he pr- pursued her yeah, for definitely. the most part. Yeah, there's some real. Um, she's out of my league, and um, have you seen the show? I really hope you have Beauty and the Baker. No, it's a uh, it's on Netflix. It stars uh, Victor Rasik. Do you know him? He. I'm looking at the page now. Victor Rasek is the co is the co lead of How to Make It in America. Oh, Lords of Dogtown! Hell yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Yo, it's, that's, a, that's another great two thousand five movie. It's a it, it's a great show. It's ridiculous. It was the first thing I watched during quarantine, so that will forever be uh, near and dear to my heart. But there's something like that where 
the person ha just has it decided, well, I've got no shot with this person. This person wants to hang around me, but they obviously don't mean that they're interested in me. And I'm like, yo, like, how much do you, again, like, I'm, I got the depression, everything like that, but I'm like, how, how can you not tell if somebody's, like, trying to spend time with you and do these things? Like, come on, believe in yourself mm -hmm. a little bit, these fellas. That's why Hitch yeah. is rich, though, I guess. I guess, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, like, again, there is, the, uh, part of what Hitch is saying is almost correct in that, like, the, these incel freak guys that he's, he's, he's working for, like, they are in their in their own mind like they they are only people that get in their own way and like his job right is to like stop them from tripping themselves up right mm -hmm. if they did a better job of like making it seem that way it might seem a little more lighthearted like hey my job isn't about the woman it's about you and focusing on you i'm basically just a therapist yeah that's what i was just gonna say it's what i was just gonna say he's basically a therapist yeah more or less but they made it more about him spitting game right and you know what i mean like like working on how to attract someone versus making you feel more comfortable with yourself yeah and then it might be a little bit different this is i mean you mentioned earlier like if this were to be made today i think that that's an extremely interesting exercise of like how this movie would be different because there is so much and again like just the time in which it was made there's so much of like breaking the fourth wall saying like basic interactions you look at her face she's looking at this thing and you're basically treating women or significant others people you're courting as like Prizes. puzzles and yeah. like mm -hmm. this is how they work this is how you you win and that wouldn't be done today because like that's just not like just treat people like people yeah. and uh but i think you actually could make this movie today but you would just you have definitely. to do it more with what you said which is i don't work on them i don't like game them i trick you into having the confidence that you should have anyway because if you're actually going to be compatible and get along with this person then you need to have way more confidence than you have right now yeah he, he treats uh, the movie kind of treats women more like prey you know what i mean totally, right like, totally, yeah. totally, you're totally. prey and i'm gonna teach you how to hunt it's like it, man, that's how we got to work on you know what i mean you gotta fix these guys and make them more <clears throat> more self-confident in the eyes of everybody not just the one woman you're trying to search for in this case which by the way he had like what 100 percent success rate what if these guys just we're going after a woman that didn't like them. Right. That, yeah. That that's scenario. So that's, the, that's sort of where like the, the gap is there where it's like, you know, he says that he doesn't do anything. And like, from what we see, he doesn't really do anything, but somehow it works every time. So like, there is like this sense of he's tricking women into liking these guys. Yeah. But then like, there's what we see is really like him just giving confidence to these guys to approach the women. But there's also like that very immature thing of like, and I'm talking like really immature, like kids when you're talking about um, like, I like my, my sisters are like my female classmates or whatever talking about like, Oh, I just, I, I just want to marry Justin Timberlake or whatever. And it's like, it, again, these are like kids talking, but like you just have it in your brain. Like, I've decided right. this is the perfect person and there's no real consideration. Yeah, you have the into fantasy like in your head. Real things. Mm -hmm. And it seems that probably a lot of his clients are adults who think this way. And I don't I don't know of any like relationships where people are like, I really, really like I really, really want to date this person. And then like they get together and you could tell, like, oh well, they're not they, they don't really have the best chemistry or whatever, but they just stay together because that person really, like that was just a goal of that right. person's to date that person. So I don't mm -hmm. know. Maybe there's some, uh, maybe there's uh, a, a bit of the characters caring more about status, like winning yeah. than actually being happy. That's where like, I think they could have benefited with another scene similar to the, the Vance introduction where he's like, yeah, I don't work for guys that are just trying to, like, fuck a woman or whatever like yeah, that. Yeah. If they had a similar scene where, like, he had a, a client who was after a woman who just didn't like him, if, like, if they had a scene in those same lines where it's just like, well, like, you got to realize I've now taught you the, what you need to know. Right, I've done to... my part. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <clears throat> like, you, like, you can go and try to date other people, maybe people who are actually interested in you. You know what right. I mean? Yeah. Um, could have benefited from that. On a scale of 1 to 10, how realistic is it that you would ever go on a first date that is at 7 a.m. on a Sunday in which you're jet skiing on the Hudson River. Uh, Your percent chance. I would say nine. 
if if a girl yeah. invited me to do that, I'd be like, this is the coolest thing I've ever encountered right. in my life. If a guy invited you to do that, he wants to murder you. Oh, like, fair, he wants to, yeah. He wants to ride you out into the middle of the Hudson Yard River and just drown you. Fair. And, like, that's where that comes in place. But, like, if you inverse the, the relationship there, I would be, like, so pumped for that. Like, you would not believe. Go I, jet skiing? I would be like, this is a cool date idea, but can we not do seven? How about ten? Yeah, no, so that's that's what I found most interesting. Like, the idea of being like, hey, let's do uh, a morning first date. That's creative. That's interesting. Like, Master of None has the thing when they they make their first date a trip to a weekend trip to Nashville. But that doesn't seem ridiculous because it's two people who have hooked up before and they're taking then, like, a plunge. wanted to date, but yeah. they were in different relationships or whatever. And like, they've known each other. And then like, this is yeah. more of like a, we're celebrating that we get to date by doing this. But like, if a random, if like a person you meet is like, Hey, do you want to get on a plane with me? And we've never really spent more than 10 minutes together. That's weird. But something like what those two had, which is like, there's a bit of, there, there's quite a bit of repartee they have. So much of this movie is the status of how Will Smith and Eva Mendez are talking to each other. Yes. It's so many different points. One isn't talking to the other one and by like the fourth time it happened i was like then don't fucking talk to each other <laughs> don't talk anymore end the fucking movie because i uh, yeah there was just there were just so much like wait i just wanted to come and apologize or wait oh what are you not talking to me now okay then don't get together they suck they they uh they basically hate each other from the entire movie after the first date until the end ending like montage or whatever you want to call it which is the weird part because I do think that like they they gave some good chemistry to Kevin James and Allegra for what it's worth. I do think they they kind of like infantilized the view of of Allegra Cole because he's like, yeah, you know how like he put the mustard on me, so I felt like less of a dork. Like no celebrity in the world no. is saying that. Like oh, I feel like a freaking dork here. Yeah, the <laughs> side on the mix, biggest celebrity in the world. Like no one's saying that. Um, but like I, I think that their actual back and forth was like charming. Even Mendez and Will Smith, I do think they they had some chemistry issues as far as like me being like, like they're both very attractive people, but I'm just like, I don't feel like that, that gut level lightning strike attraction that he keeps talking about. You know what I mean? I totally agree. And you, you are right about the, the chemistry between Albert and Allegra. Like I totally buy that. I don't totally buy the cartoony qualities of Albert, but that's only some of it. Like when they're having normal interactions, I buy that. But again, that's part of like the she's out of my league type dynamic where like he once he gets over like, OK, I'm having a conversation with this person. I'm just in this moment. Then he's fine. So I believe their chemistry for sure. Yeah, I mm -hmm. felt like uh, Will Smith and Eva Mendez's character were just like this is a constant war of who can be more skept skeptical about dating. Yeah. And it's mm -hmm. just like, what do you even like about each other? There's also like a lot of. There's a lot of goofiness in this movie of like wacky. Oh, he's trying to dance, or like oh, he's spilling the mustard on kicking himself, kicking her in the face, or like, like oh yeah, he kicked her in the reaction. face. Yeah. And uh, I wrote down in my notes, you know, in like Seinfeld, mainly in Seinfeld, it happens when they go to the movies and they're seeing a comedy. It's there. You see them in their in their seats at the theater, and it's just like flashing lights and silly music playing. There's just music playing the whole time yeah. they're at the movie. That's what this movie is. <laughs> Hitch yeah. is that movie where just like the entire time it's like, whoop, doop, up, doop, he's fat. Like all these crazy mm -hmm. things. And I'm like, I always wondered what movie they're watching when they're at, when they're at the movies in Seinfeld. This is sack lunch. <laughs> this movie mm -hmm. is sack lunch. I get, no, I tell you by that. There it's is just... a lot of cheap humor. Yeah. Right. So that, that's, <clears throat> I, I guess I've been searching for that. Uh, there's a place for that too, which is kind of the I think no the, doubt. like this. I don't think this movie was trying to be like like a groundbreaking romantic comedy. Like I think it knew what it was in the sense that like they're they wanted to have those sort of cheap laughs that can appeal to everybody because romantic comedies like especially at that point like none of them were really made with the intention of being like a big sick or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. None of them were trying to blend or do dramedy in that same sort of sort of sense. Like they weren't trying to do an elevated comedy even really. It's just like basically the the fart humor stuff of romantic comedies like that's what they would do and it worked in this i i do think that in that sense if you look at this in a bubble of 2005 
that humor was like not by no means top of the line, but it was like a slightly above probably the average moviegoers like regular expectation. Mm -hmm. And I think that in that sense, it was definitely, I would say a success at, yeah, at and the very an least. Enormous like TV value because oh, it's yeah. always on TV. Yeah. I wonder what, I wonder what it grossed. I have no idea. Um, I wish that there was, is that, has, did anyone come up with like a, the, the MFK thing is done, right? People don't play that game anymore. Right. Uh, but is there like a is there like a PG version that people can play on podcasts or anything? I see people do that on TikTok, but I forget what they say. Okay, I well, think they say like they, I think they say like hook up, it's like kiss, marry, or something smooch, like that. hug, or yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's do smooch, hug, or um, what's like a mean thing that you do? To Fart. Me, uh, smooch, hug, or respectfully decline. <laughs> Smooch okay. hug or respectfully decline. Robbie from Dirty Dancing. Vance from oh. Dirty No, Vance from, from Hitch. From Hitch, yeah. And both of the Schumachers <laughs> from Dirty Dancing. These are some bad seeds. I I really like Jeffrey Donovan. I'm a big fan. We follow each other on 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 Twitter. Love I've that. been trying to get a burn notice movie made for not <laughs> Sam X. That movie wasn't that good. I'm trying to get a burn notice movie made for a while. Uh, we interviewed what's his name, Dulé Hill, who's from Psych recently, and I was okay. just like, "Yeah, like it's great you're having a third Psych movie. Uh, can you get a Burn Notice movie made?" And he's like, "No, <laughs> it's very fun." Uh, but uh, I I'm gonna have to smooch Jeffrey Donovan. Uh, I think I'll I'll hug the Schumachers and kill Robbie. Uh, or, yeah. or, or sorry, respectfully decline Robbie. <laughs> but I or actually I'd kill Robbie. No, he's yeah, I was gonna say yeah. he's a bastard. Yeah. I mean, if we if don't have Johnny to feel bad. had killed Robbie, what a suck for Johnny. Johnny right. would have gone away, and but other than that, like yeah, fuck. Yeah, Robbie. I'm in. I'm in the same. No, I, I, I have all the same answers. I think the Schumachers could use a hug. I think love that, that answer. Like they they could use some compassion. I don't know what's gone wrong in their lives where they need to feel like they have to steal money and. Oh, I got. Go ahead. And then you know, for Vance, I think that Vance is problematic for sure. But maybe there's a good guy in there somewhere. I, I I feel like there's more potential for a good guy in Vance than there is in Robbie. Like, Ro Robbie has zero shred of being a good guy. All right, so Robbie, Avi, is dead. I would I would say it's easy to fuck or smooch Vance because famously, that's all he's trying to do anyway. That's true, yeah. So he's, you're just doing to him what he's trying to do to you. It's a transaction, yeah. That, though, would leave you hugging the Schumachers, who famously, they get a little handsy. That's They're going to be reaching mm -hmm. in those pockets. The last person you want to hug is someone who steals wallets. So I'm going to have to make love to the shoes and hug, hug Vance. True, but if you hug the Schumachers around the waist, that forces them to go high, in which they can't pick your pocket. True. Can you... Can you dress for the occasion? What, what pa uh, pants with no? Uh... No, one of those like tourist belts. You know those the high waisted belts that they have. Like <laughs> yeah. when you go to Europe, they say, "Yeah, like oh, where are these?" Because there's pickpockets. First couple times I went to Europe, I was so fucking distracted. I was like <laughs> looking for. I was trying to like solve the case, and I was like middle school or whatever. But I'm like, ooh, who's trying to come for my fucking Velcro two dollars? Like, Just wear a sweatshirt. That's Ducks like. Wallet. <laughs> Just wear a sweatshirt that's like two or three sizes too big that covers covers your pockets and is heavy enough that like if somebody lifted it up, you'd feel it. Could also do a bunch of decoy wallets. <laughs> <laughs> when I uh, when I went to New York for school, my mom was like, "Oh, you gotta make sure you put your wallet in your front pocket, or else people are gonna steal it." She had like the 1970s version, like uh, of uh, of like what do you call it? Um, that Charles Bronson movie. Like it all stuck in her brain. Like everything is crime, nothing but crime. And I was just like. I did it for probably a month, and I was like, this fucking sucks. Well, I like sitting on my wallet. So if you are a jeans person, especially if it's dark wash jeans, you should be doing the wallet in the front pocket. It because... stops you from your, your back, right? And also it fucks up. You, you end up with an indent of, mm -hmm. you know, like, the trace of, you know, if you take, like, a, a McDonald's like receipt a can or something, and, like, yeah. flick it, there's, like, the carbon traces. Mm -hmm. You kind of get that with... Not like carbon, but you uh, get the the white outline 
of a wallet. Not if you use a Ridge wallet. Today's episode is brought. Yeah. No, it's not. But <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I was gonna say. I mean, folks, if if fellas, if you're not using the thinnest wallet you can find, then to quote Dirty Dancing, "Oh baby, what is you doing?" Got to yeah, remember that line. As thin as right. I mean, he. It, it's when they have sex for the first time. He says, <laughs> uh, "Oh baby, what is you doing?" But by the way, I just looked it up. Hitch was the tenth highest grossing movie in the United States uh, that, that year. Oh my god! Yeah, which is crazy because like this this point in the early two thousands is right when like the top ten in um, uh, highest grossing movies of the year kind of shifted mm. away from being movies where like it could be an original property or whatever to being franchises. Like this year, it was Goblet of Fire, Revenge of the Sith, uh, Chronicles of Narnia. But like when you go back to like in my favorite year of references, nineteen ninety eight, the top highest grossing movies are titanic yes uh armageddon Armageddon. saving private ryan and then there's something about mary which like not in a million trillion goddamn years could that movie be released or a movie of the equal quality in row and like relevant to our time be released right now and be in the top 10 highest grossing movies let alone like even in the top like 20 it's crazy yo when we did affleck week we had such a fun detour because we realized that like 97, 98, and obviously that's when Affleck was really throwing heat because he's doing Goodwill Hunting, he's doing Armageddon and everything. But like, we ended up doing during Affleck Week, which was supposed to be all Ben Affleck content. One of the episodes was just as good as it gets because there was just like so much, cr- like 1997 and 1998 for movies was like 1975 through 1977 for music, where like every Billy Joel, Stevie Wonder, Steely Dan. Fleetwood Mac, Eagles, like every like classic album that you can think of came out in this fucking like two year span where if you put out a great album, tough noogies, you're going up against Hotel California or something like that, or you're going up (laughs) against rumors. That legitimately is what that period was was like. I mean, I'm sure that you guys have hit that age in movies a ton on uh, Lights, Camera, Podcast, but it is gnarly the type of shit that was happening back then. I think I could find, thankfully, movie rankings down. We can, we can sort by decade. I wonder what my top of the 90s would even be. It would be Goodfellas. Or that's early 90s. Yeah. Lion King, Saving Private Ryan, Fargo, Goodwill Hunting, Princess Mononoke. That's an anime. You guys probably love that, right? Absolutely. Uh, Shawshank Redemption, uh, Schindler's List, and Life is Beautiful, and a couple other random ones. Fugitive's up here, too. Wow. Well, that was already on a, that yeah. was a Tomato Fights selection. Oh, yeah. We had the Fugitive last Fugitive. week. Yeah. Oh, actually, you know what might be fun? We've never done this before, but everything's a work in progress. I'm going to throw some past tomato fights at you and just okay. say, oh, well, what do you think is better? We should okay. absolutely do that. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, yeah, I'm down with that. Show meeting? Cool. Yeah. Uh, all right. First one we did was Jerry Maguire versus State of Play. And it's so cool because I know you've seen State of Play because you've seen every movie. <laughs> Let's see. I'm going to go. I can I can find you empirically which one I find better. Jerry Ooh. Maguire, oh, I gave right. you 84. Uh, state of play. I'm really bad at typing. These right are now. 84s. State of play, by I gained 82. So okay, so I gave Whoa. I gave um state of play two points less, which I like state of play. By the way, no disrespect to state of play. Really like that movie. Uh, by the way, quite a bit of di- we had a decent amount of disrespect. To state yeah, of play. yeah. It was it was uh like a run of the mill political yeah. thriller. I felt like uh this is the second tomato fights matchup featuring Jerry Maguire. No third. How so? Because we did a Batman one. Dark Knight. Jerry Maguire exists in the Batman universe. That's right. Did you know that? Holy shit. There's a reference to Jerry Maguire. He says you complete me and in the Batman Lego movie, they watch Jerry Maguire. I'm not a big superhero person. My greatest uh, superhero analysis or insight was realizing that Jerry Maguire definitively (laughs) exists in the Batman universe. I yeah, like a lot more. They reference that a lot. Because Joker says, tells Batman, yep. you complete you me. You complete me. I'm surprised they don't say you show me the money in a lot of more movies, too. <laughs> that's true. Like, Every that's, that's a very referenced quote. Yeah. That, so that <laughs> the one meeting, earns it. The meeting of all the gangsters in the Dark Knight where they're, like, in that, like, kitchen area. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Just all the gangsters being like, hey, show me the money. <laughs> <laughs> he does quite literally show them a lot of money. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Fire, yeah. so it all works out. Yeah. That's... Everybody that so that is a big like payoff or a big uh like movie quote that 
is delivers. It, yeah. it delivers. That that pays off. The when you finally mm-hmm. see, if you haven't seen Jerry Maguire and you watch it, when it gets to show me the money, you're like, oh, dope. That's yeah. awesome. Well, they they really sink their teeth into into show me the money. They spend like <laughs> yeah. Then it gets twenty little, minutes. It gets a little uh, dicey as far as like how Jerry Maguire is. Anyway, um, episode two was with Sean Evans was Chicago versus the Sixth Sense, both eighty sixes. I do like Chicago. Gave Chicago an 82. The Sixth Sense, I think I would rate higher, I would assume. Yeah, 92 for me. Okay. Yeah. So that's like a, like a bad 10-point swing. So Whoa. I definitely like Sixth Sense way more. Although, admittedly, it is uh, not as good on rewatch after you know. Yeah, right. That's That was basically our yeah. big takeaway. Chicago ended up winning. Yeah, Chicago ended up winning. I just, I think it maybe that's something if I re-digested Chicago. So I haven't watched that in a long time. Like, I'll go through uh sort of musical stretches where i'll watch something like moulin rouge and be like oh shit this is actually pretty good or whatever and so maybe when i go back to do um chicago again i'll like it more do you uh do you go to broadway shows bruv i was actually at lion king two weeks ago i think something like that it was awesome oh very fun time nice so uh i don't know if you know this we discussed this on our most recent episode uh our guy sandy lost his battle with uh life yeah with, yeah with to quote steven sondheim being alive um yeah but he's now quite old now he's in good company in heaven but Jesus. uh i'm gonna be in uh new york in a couple of weeks and i'm like you know you what? should write obituaries for a living <laughs> just like a lot of like this is they, but I, because it's like i think i would absolutely lose my shit and never stop laughing if like the first line of a death article was like someone so he, lost their life he lost his, lost his battle yeah, with nickname, being alive old pd no old, old pd no breath okay and so we're not making jokes about steven sondheim i'd like to clarify just now death, we're making jokes death. about pete's potential death like very cool old, old pd uh yeah, old PD Rigamortis lost his battle with not having Rigamortis. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I think I'm uh, I think I'm gonna try to get to some place. It's about time. Um, yes, ep- R.I.P. Sondheim. Apparently, West Side Story, the the Seward remake, is awesome. Is I it? got invited to the screener, but I had to do the Cyber Monday thing, so I missed out on it. Oh, that's started. right. That's... I mean, it looks good. Yeah. I'm just mad that Steven Spielberg, a man who can do literally anything that he wants is like, I'm going to remake this thing that everybody knows. Yeah, he's become a fan in his older years of just doing things that he likes, I think, versus taking risks. Like, he yeah. does The Post right. and something else, like, equivalently boring. But apparently he did a really, really good job here. And, like, it's it, it's more, uh, apparently it's success is about his direction and making it good through his, like, ability to just technically be a great director you know okay. what i mean i'm excited you know what's awesome about the post is fucking nothing that yeah, movie, that movie yeah, sucked. sucked that movie My, sucked. you know what uh episode three was uh braveheart versus scream both 79 and that was a brave killer matchup literally i fucking i love braveheart so i'm such a homer for this uh but i gave braveheart a 90 and sorry what was the other one scream scream is probably i would assume an 80 for me 81 81. So a couple points are I, I fucking love Braveheart. That's like a staple watch for like me, my dad, my two younger brothers. Like we would just be like watch that be like, oh, fuck a freedom. Like it's watching just guy kill stuff. shit of the yeah. Exactly. Just watching Braveheart with your dad and my dad being like, Yeah, fucking, you know we're a little bit Scottish, right? He loved, <laughs> he said we're a little bit of everything. We're none of anything. We're just like Eastern European rats <laughs> with a little bit of Irish like joined in. Um, but I loved watching that movie. I also sneaky love Outlaw King, the Netflix movie. It's it's not great. It's way better than than credits gave it credit for. It starts off with a 16 minute long take. Like Ugh. it is crazy. And like and it's all perfectly executed in that sense. And like there's some crazy fight scenes. Um really really good acting from uh, uh Aaron Tyler Johnson or Taylor Johnson rather is so fucking good in that movie. Okay. After watching that I want him to play Wolverine cuz he's like incredible like rage like acting. Interesting. Uh episode 4 with Jay Baruchel was uh this was uh Seth Rogen's favorite episode by a mile famously <laughs> he tweeted about he tweeted uh I, what was it this I could is watch my this fa- all no, day no it was this is this is my favorite episode yet he tweeted <laughs> tell me you did the goon with Jay Baruchel we did We're speed versus the dark knight okay speed 
Speed, I assume, is yeah, 90 for me. Okay. Dark. These are 94s on tomatoes. Yeah. Dark Knight stuff gonna be higher for me. Uh, 98 for me. So that's that's an easy win for Dark Knight. Although I do think Speed has its place in the pantheon. Mm. Of, oh yeah. Of TV action movies. It is. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I think that Speed is pound for pound one of the funniest movies that ever existed. <laughs> There's a really good line to that. Dennis Hopper, too, by the way. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Phenomenal film. Rest in peace to a great one. Yeah. And just, so the, and just the premise of that movie is hilarious. Mm -hmm. It's so stupid. It's one of the dumbest <laughs> yeah. premises, yeah. but it works. Yeah. And apparently, and you guys probably, I'm assuming I've gone over this. This is like one of those dumb old pieces of, of movie trivia. They wanted to make a speed that took place on a boat. Yes, they, and they did. They, they did. did. Oh, that was they Speed made a 2. Sequel. I never watched yeah. Speed 2. I'll tell you who so. didn't want to make a uh, sequel that took place on a boat. Keanu Reeves. Keanu he didn't Reeves. fucking do the movie. <laughs> And they just yep. did it without him. And poor Sandy Bullock. Uh, just... a, a solid 2% on Rotten Tomatoes yeah. for Speed 2. Who was it? Uh, who was the guy? Was it? I, I'm just thinking the guy who plays Robin in Batman and Robin, but I don't think that's It right. was a real guy that would they were, that would, like was happening back then. I forgot. Let's see. Speed mm. 2, Cruise Control. <laughs> that's right. Cruise Control. Now Jason that, Patrick. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, he was definitely happening. Yeah, at one point. Um, on Dennis Hopper, so I fucking love Dennis Hopper too. You must love him because nobody has ever said Jack into a phone. Oh yes, more than Dennis Hopper between twenty four and Speed. All Dennis Hopper did in his career is say, "Don't you get it, Jack?" Or <laughs> or like, "Don't you come get on, it, Jack?" Jack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Victor no, big Drazen. fan of it. Usually, whenever the the name Jack comes across, and when I grew up, I didn't know. I'm like my legal name is Jack. Mm -hmm. Like I knew some people that were Johns and go by Jacks or whatever. I didn't know a single Jack growing up ever. And the only Jacks out besides like 90 year old people because it's popular with really old people and then very very young like kids, kids now and then Jackson. In their teens. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they love that. Um, but whenever I would hear Jack, it would be in movies and TV, and the Jack would always be a bad guy for the most part, mm -hmm. which it's just it was tough. It was tough growing up, not being named Matt or Chris or something. <laughs> Jack Harlow, uh, bringing it back, though. It's true. Episode five with the great Randy Havens was The Social Network versus The Fuji Boy. I think The Social Network is going to be higher for me. Social, social Network is a masterpiece. Yeah, man. I went, yeah, for me. Pete and I both went Social Network, and Randy was very upset about that. Social Network for me is in 90, Fugitive is in 96. Wow. So Fugitive. Whoa. That makes sense. Wow. I did watch The Fugitive recently, and I do really, really love The Fugitive. And I think oh, same. That, excellent. Both excellent movies. I, I just, it's, it's one of those things where it comes down to a little bit of personal preference where, like, the script in Social Network is insanely good. Like, it's it's all time. Um, and I really, really like Jesse Eisenberg, who's weirdly done – lcb twice for some reason um like i really <laughs> like him in that uh andrew garfield too yeah um it's really good i, I just i didn't find the subject matter particularly interesting and that's not a fincher thing that's just like i never really gave a fuck about zuckerberg and that just came down to like i really love how this is executed i just don't really particularly find so p it, was saying like that's what makes it so great though yeah it's like that, such like, a boring subject when matter it, out, it exceeds in spite of yeah. that yeah, yeah when it was yeah. coming out i didn't see it in theaters i didn't go to see mm -hmm. that movie and there was like a lot of buzz about it but i was like i don't fucking care about right. mark zuckerberg so and is that rating uh like after your initial watch so like we so with at least with moviebrainings.net like we we just basically put out the put down the four thousand or so movies or whatever in a big Excel sheet and we just go through and we just you know this score this score this score this okay. score whatever we want so like yeah, obviously huge if I didn't put it down like right after I had, I had okay, watched it yeah. I watched it previously so we can't rewatch every movie before we put it in but we just do it based off of our general remembering okay um at least for the older movies. Um, and with the fugitive, I remember. I think it's on HBO Max. I watched it, real, or maybe it was at the time. I remember watching it and I was being like, "Damn, this is so excellent in the way that they craft suspense here." And that's a movie where, like, there's very few movies that do this, and definitely Social Network doesn't because there's 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 a long runtime with that. There's not a wasted frame. I think in the fugitive, like every moment means something, and every moment like engrosses you more into the suspense of this guy trying to like clear his name and figure this out, and like you know figuring out what's happening with. I think like. Is Joe Pantolinato? Yes. This too? Yeah, he's like a legend. He's like one of those one of those guys where like every time you'll see him in a movie and he has like slightly better hair and you're like, oh, fucking Joe Pantolinato. Yeah. That happened to me with uh, what's his name? Walton Goggins, I think, is in the oh, first yes. porn, porn yeah. movie. Oh, wow. And like he just has no hair, and I'm like, oh, he got he got plugs to look like he has a receding hairline, which is interesting. Um, but he, but yeah, Fugitive is is truly excellent. Yeah, Joey Pants, just absolute legend, excellent in everything he's in. 
And honestly, I don't know if you saw um, U.S. Marshals. Oh yeah, but that's I really thought good they were too. the same movie. <laughs> I always thought they were like related because of uh, they Tommy are. Lee. So they are. Yeah, yeah like, it's I, a spiritual oh, yeah, spinoff. Yeah, yeah. What, was I, what am I? What am I thinking of? The movie with um, shoot. Oh, is there I'm another? Is there another one where he's like a cop or so, like something? Adjacent Catch me to? if you can. No, <laughs> yeah. there's a movie where um, Tommy Lee Jones is hunting um, Benicio Jim del Carrey. <laughs> no, well, yeah, in real life. <laughs> Uh, I need this guy out of the picture. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's the hunted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so he, the movie was the hunted. It came out in two thousand three, okay. and it was was. I don't even think he was a marshal or. Oh, yeah. he was. It was oh, L. T. Bonham hunting down Benicio del Toro in the yeah. wilderness. That'd be amazing if like uh, Jim Carrey got a call one day and was like, "Hey, uh, just a heads up, uh, Tommy Lee Jones wants you out of the picture." Like, <laughs> what? Is he gonna kill me? No, he doesn't. Whatever movie you're working on right now, he's just making whatever calls he can. He you are not a good actor. Picture. He wants you out of that picture. He uh, cannot respect you, and he he does not want Incredible. to ha- share the same profession as you. To Jim Carrey's credit, Jim Carrey could probably do any role Tommy Lee Jones does. Tommy Lee Jones could not do almost love any that. role. Love that. that Fair Jim point. Carrey. Yeah, I love to do that with people. Like I do that with music a lot, where. Um, like Beyonce could do everything Adele does, mm-hmm. but Adele could not do one thing that Beyonce does, and it's crazy because They're... Adele's great. But like, just when like looking at like skill sets, it's a fun way to measure up how people who have similar jobs uh, are pound for pound. The I've just been very sick. There's too much Adele in the news recently. And I know it's the album, but every album she has is the same, where it's like one good song and then a bunch of shit. Yes. And like I'm just I'm not a fan of that. I'm not a fan of that, and I just I'm not want to see Adele anymore. No, Ad- Adele is for I, Adele is a great talent, obviously, but Adele is in that Taylor Swift world of like just because she makes something, it is decided this is the best and this is the most important. It is uh, poptimism, I believe, is the the term for it, but it's. <laughs> crazy and then i feel bad because well, i end like, up like it sounds like i'm like shitting yeah. on adele or taylor swift or whatever and i'm like but like people nah, are can we pu- just like appreciate shit for what it actually is right people are like putting aside time to like to love something rather than putting aside time to consume it yeah and like I- critically uh mm-hmm. and like analyze it i guess yeah like people I- are like oh new taylor swift album this friday can't wait to to sit down and tweet about how much i love it yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, like we're all gonna get together. One of my friends, uh, with the whole Spotify rap thing, we were just talking about different artists, and he was like, "Man, am I dumb for not really liking Dua Lipa? Everyone loves Dua Lipa so much. Like, am I dumb?" And I was like, "No, you just happen to not like that artist. But the way that we treat pop music now is like you have to like what's popular. It's a full time. Yeah, yeah, right. It is a full time job being a fan of certain acts. Like, I don't think anybody." enjoys Heim's music more than I do, but I have a very like good Heim schedule where like mm-hmm. not an overwhelming amount of my energy and time is spent towards being a Heim fan. Not like, yet, not until I, Licorice Pizza comes out. Yeah. Right, yeah. If I, once I see Licorice Pizza a second time, like it's all over. But you know what I'm saying? Like like I listen to Heim and th- that's when I'm doing Heim stuff. I can't spend all day like yelling at people who I feel are slighting them by not liking them as much as me. But that's another story yeah. for uh, another time. Hitch versus Dirty Dancing. Who you got, Ken Jack? So in my empirical rating, I do have Hitch rated a point higher than wow. Dirty Dancing. And I'll stand by that because I, I do think Dirty Dancing, if they do do a very, very good job of I think showing off the talents of Patrick Swayze specifically. Um, I don't think Jennifer Grey does a, a ton for that movie. Um, I don't think the plot is particularly believable. I, I think the ending, like you guys are saying, I, I'm not a huge fan of that sudden departure from the period appropriate stuff. It does feel like a very out of time movie, like because everything they're saying, the way they're acting, all that stuff doesn't feel very 1963. It feels very 1980, whatever. Yeah. Um, and that's 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 fine. I think that takes away from a little. I, I think though that is very much carried by the fact that Patrick Swayze just is that charismatic and that 
just likable and sexy and his dance moves are insane and like all of the moves and especially him and whoever the actress that played um penny was a phenomenal dancer like incredibly good dancer um and meanwhile when you look at hitch i i do just think that every actor is better in hitch than every actor is in um uh dirty dancing if that makes sense like i think kevin james does kevin james but he does it very well I think the actress who played um, Allegro is very good. Eva Mendez, I think, was Eva Mendez in a great way. Will Smith was Will Smith. But, like, they're all, they all did a respectively better job than everyone with the exception of Swayze did in Dirty Dancing. And other than that, I think the enjoyment level is about the same for me. We're like, I'm laughing. I'm laughing. I'm, I'm clearly laughing along. I like the little uh, quote unquote shitty lesson at the end of Hitch. But, like, with Dirty Dancing, like, I, I don't think they, they nailed the ending. So that really. It, that's really what it comes down to me. It just comes down to the acting and the endings. It is interesting that had they legitimately f- like flown away at the end of the movie, then I feel like it actually would it would have been weird, but like the rest of it would have been okay. They're like, wait a second. So not only is this song that absolutely wouldn't exist back then playing, like the dad's like, oh yeah, sweet. My kid daughter's fucking this. Like, like just all these things that like, Wait, wait, how is this changing so quickly happen? If they had legitimately, if they did like a Bollywood ending or something, or just like something that like detached it from the rest of the movie, like officially, then maybe all of those what the fuck moments would be fine because it's like, all right, and now this is where the movie breaks away and does its big crazy thing. Or if it transitioned almost in the same vein of Saving Private Ryan to like them dancing as adults in 1980, whatever to that song oh. in the same stage or something with their grandkids or uh, something like that. And that right? would have been great because that li- like yeah. all those years later that song would be it'd be saying like that that was the time of their life but they're still happy today and, and that they're, they're been old perfect. now so they're stealing wallets. Yeah. Exactly. Obviously as one does. They're doing like crypto heists. <laughs> um for like me 1987, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they still fuck it up. They flash forward <laughs> to avoid that issue with the music production <laughs> and then they do a bunch of references to like 34 years later. They're like, "Ah, oh, fuck." Uh for me this one is very, very clear. Um, I do think that Hitch has fallen victim to time. Um, a lot of it has not, a lot of it has become tired. Like, I think that a lot of the jokes that may have hit in 2005 have since become very tired. And, um, you know, it's, I, I think that the humor doesn't hold up as as well as as it should and the message is too flimsy and too there's too many holes in the message that it presents and i just think it's way more fun to live in the world that dirty dancing presents even with its flaws and its uh and it's like ridiculousness i think that living in the world of dirty dancing is a lot more fun a lot more enjoyable a lot more engrossing than living in like a very sort of bland and I, like unspectacular yeah, world of Hitch. Oh yeah, both of these movies are sixty nines, and I don't, I will not use much breath arguing that that either of them deserve higher. I definitely don't think that Hitch deserves higher, but like these are to be sure imperfect movies. There, there's not going to be a like, well, Hitch can't really execute what Dirty Dancing does here because I don't think that either of these movies are particularly tremendous, but. I agree with the point that you make, Pete, where I think that if I saw Hitch when it came out, I would have some sort of like baked in appreciation and understanding of, oh, well, this is what I thought of it then. And this is how it made me feel then. And maybe there'd be some nostalgia when you go back and rewatch these very, very tired jokes. But unfortunately, I only have the perspective of somebody in 2021 being extremely disappointed by the you did not just do that humor, and there's a lot of that. So I go Dirty Dancing. Uh, well, what are your rankings on movie rankings for these? Um, so I have Dirty Dancing as a 66. I have Hitch as a 67. So not crazy far off the Rotten Tomatoes score in this case, actually, um, but which is – that's good. See, that's the thing is where Rotten Tomatoes um, – in when with older movies where there's a lot of reviews in, like it will become more accurate. When movies are just coming out, it can really be fucked up. Um, especially like when you see, um, 
a, a dune come out and it has like an 80 percent rotten tomato score after like five reviews or whatever like that like that's where you can get like fucked up um but in movies like this sometimes it's a little more accurate uh but yeah no I th- i'm i'm happy with those standings i agree with you guys in that like I, I don't think either of them are particularly excellent but both of them it's more specifically dirty dancing if you, like you talk to uh, like an older person they'll be like like oh dirty dancing was the shit everyone was all about dirty dancing it was the best movie ever blah 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 blah. no one's ever says that about hitch i don't think <laughs> like <laughs> no one of that same age group that was watching hitch is like oh you gotta watch hitch it's like the best movie ever but i do th- i do think people have fond memories from it and from that era in in comedy you know TBS I mean? fucking and, loves it. So, oh my god, I do not believe they think it's like it, it's like chicken soup for the soul. That's right. And like it's just it's very in a very inappropriate movie in in certain respects and in retrospect. All right, Ken Jack. Well, we appreciate you coming on with us. We did a million years ago. We did a crossover episode with you boys, and we got into a we famously got into a rap battle, mm-hmm. a rap beef, I should say over the movie Blockers, and I always enjoy having you, you, you with us. It's always a treat when we get to, to chat with you. We'll have to do some sort of crossover thing again, but we appreciate you uh, helping fight these tomatoes, my man. Of course, absolutely. We'll have to work on a crossover LCB episode again soon. We'll, we'll have to find another movie to fight about, to rap about, too, because maybe I'll subcontract the job out to, like, Roan or someone else who can actually <laughs> rap instead. Just bring in a ringer. Absolutely screw you guys. We just need to find a next John Cena movie that comes out. Maybe we'll do it over the piece. Oh, I would, I would, no no disrespect to Jeff. Jeff definitely has to be on the track. I would very much welcome Roan's participation. Mm -hmm. I would. We have a, we have a Jack Harlow connection. It would be quite funny if our ringer was Jack Harlow. Yeah. (laughs) That would be hilarious. We would absolutely, we would win that by 10 miles. Yes. With the now you're like making music. No, no, no disrespect to uh, any of your rapping skills, but if we got Harlow in here, I like this team. Ass is cooked. I, li- I like Harlow this team. Harlow on the track. 